unit. And what a great group you have to meet here today. Um, what I think I'd like to start out with is, let's see. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Um, I bet you didn't know that doctors are superstitious. Uh -oh. <laughs> Um, I, I bet you didn't know that doctors are superstitious. Did you know that? No. Yes. No? Okay. <laughs> so, much. Um, so all of my best talks have started by me asking, what did you come here to hear a doctor talk about behaviors and behavioral techniques and medications for? Um, anyone feel brave you want to throw out, why did you come here to, to hear this? Or you just came for this terrific group and all these, these <laughs> terrific speakers? Yes. You know, I kind of think that we as doctors tend to put on medications and we're taught what medications to give. We're not really taught what medications to take away. So I consider them kind of like barnacles. As we get older, you know, as ships stay in the ocean longer, they get more barnacles. And as we get older, we often get more medications, or those are our barnacles. So we'll talk about what some of the medications that might be causing problems are. Any other questions? Yes.
uh, their family tradition. And it's really a beautiful thing to observe. Um, the exercise, I cannot overemphasize that. I would add to what Dr. Edgerly was saying is that there is one other medication that I think is useful, um, and that's a baby aspirin. So exercise helps um, the heart, it helps the, uh, it helps the brain, and baby aspirin cuts down the risk of little strokes. You definitely want to talk to your doctor because there's a few people who shouldn't take it. But the more we can do to keep our heart healthy, the more we do to keep our brain healthy. And that helps people get out the restlessness during the day. It's much better to have someone walk, walk, walk during the day and then be able to sleep at night than being sitting around watching TV, maybe dozing in the afternoon and then not sleeping at night and ending up getting um, sleeping pills when they really just need to be active during the day. A healthy diet. I would say it's really important um, to have, as, as Dr. Edgerly was saying, to have uh, lots of fruits and vegetables, a good diet, but particularly, no more caffeine. I know that there's a lot of doctors who really like their coffee, so they say, well, you can have a few cups a day. I would say no caffeine, and then you have to watch it with the alcohol, because both of those can make people more restless, more irritable, and make them sleep more poorly at night. Um, the other things are, so along those lines, the stimulants are um, the smoking. Smoking could be a problem. I think if you can engage people away from, from activities that they're used to, just sitting, drinking their coffee and smoking, that's going to help them, and I know that's tough. Um, stress management. So stress management for your elder, it's, it's different than the stress management for the caregiver. But they're, but they're linked. The caregiver needs to have a way to take care of themselves because whatever you do reflects on your, on your loved one. And so if you are trying to take care of your loved one all by yourself, and your loved one's keeping you up at night and you don't have enough sleep, and then they're saying, you know, turn off the radio, or they're saying, turn off the heat, turn off the heat, turn off the heat. I've, I've seen the most loving spouses get really kind of angry and say, stop it, it's, it's 50 degrees in here, I need it. And what's gonna happen is your loved one who's got the dementia is just gonna reflect back that frustration and anger. So I would definitely look for care partners. You know, is there a day program around? Is there more family that you can uh, in, engage to help you with the care? And also you might look at uh, home care someone's at home giving you a break at least three, four times a week. Uh, healthy sleep. Uh, basically, maintaining the sleep schedule is huge. I would say the biggest problem I see with sleep is that someone is allowed to sleep more than an hour or so in the afternoon. And then, because they slept two or three hours one day, um, they don't sleep at night. And then there's this thought, well, they didn't sleep very well last night. They, they didn't get to bed until 5 a.m. So let them sleep during the day. And then they're up all night. So you've just uh, flipped day-night sleeping. What I would say is that I would restrict daytime sleep to only an hour. Um, and then I would also make sure that if someone was staying up part of the night, I would let, I would let them consolidate their sleep um, in the morning by not waking them up at 8. This is, I don't have a slide for this, this is just a thought because I've gone through it with a couple families in the last couple days. So if someone is not sleeping from like, they sleep from 7 to 11 at night, but then they're up from 11 to 5 a.m. and that, Or they're at a facility which gives them their medications at 8 o'clock and there's breakfast at 8 o'clock and so they awake, and they're awakened at 8 o'clock. You know, have they gotten enough sleep to get through the rest of the day? So what I'd suggest, instead of waking them up at 8 o'clock, if they went to bed at 5, let them sleep till about 10 in the morning. Then they can get up. You can start their morning routine then. They could have an hour nap between 4 and 5, but then you keep them up till 11 at night. That's an awful lot of information, and I will make sure that if anyone's particularly interested in it, that I, I discuss it afterwards. And I also have a website, elderconsult.com. Um, if you have any questions, you can put it through there. Um, there's also a Facebook and a whole section on the psychoactive medications. So I will say, don't furiously scribble um, notes because 
I'd probably say it's, this is a lot of information. It's better to just take it in. And then there's a section of medications at elderconsult.com that just goes over the most common side effects and the most common uses of these medications. A good sleeping environment. I gotta say, working with elders is very much like working with teens. How many of you have a lot of trouble getting your teen to let go of the laptop at night? I've, I've caught my younger one, um, I, I'll wake up for something and I'll check and make sure he's asleep at two or three, and he's just passed out with the laptop you know, on in his bed. And there's a lot of times that elders will watch TV at night or they'll wake up at midnight and they'll decide to watch TV. Screens are bad. Even the Kindles are bad. You don't want the light photons. You, you want nice, soothing music at night, um, definitely avoiding the caffeine, avoiding too much fluid after dinner because that can make them have to get up in the middle of the night. So the, the biggest issues are uh, we want to avoid overstate. It, it's kind of like um, Goldilocks. We don't want it too hot. We don't want it too cold. We want it just right. And so we don't want overstimulation. There's a number of uh, facilities that I go into where they might put everyone in a room and they might have the TV on loud. I mean, that can be very agitating. So you want to give people their personal space. You want to engage them. Some elders with dementia enjoy group activities and other people get too irritable with too many people around. So they need smaller environments with fewer people. You want to kind of click into what works for them and what doesn't and see what you can do behaviorally. I would say one of the things that's huge is, is walking. If everyone can do it and you want to particularly make sure that you can keep your loved one moving because if you can keep them moving, you really cut down the risk of the falls, um, pressure ulcers, blood clots, and just general uh, hastening of decline. So the other thing you want to avoid is understimulation. I've seen some facilities where the elder is treated as a potted plant. And they're just parked in front of a table or, and, and left there by themselves. And you can expect that if someone is left by themselves, they're going to say, hey, hey, hey. So I, want, I would suggest that engagement is huge. And whatever sort of engagement they prefer, there's one woman that I know who um, can be very agitated with people but there's a raised garden in the facility where she is, and she will go through and she will meticulously pull all the weeds and take care of the plants. And for her, that is it. So it's very, it can be very easy, but for her, that's meaningful. The groups, not so much. Um, music is huge. I know in the Bay Area, there's a guy um, that does, he's the Samba Samba man. He just plays bongos and sings. And you think, well, that's pretty basic. Uh, but I find him to be really engaging, particularly for some of the men who kind of just sit there quietly. You'll have to try different things. For some people, it's their church music that helps them um, get back into the swing and helps them sing where they might not speak. And others, it is, you know, the big band music. What I would say is, it's probably not hip hop. So if you are going into the facility and, and, and the caregivers are playing the stuff they like, it's like, you know what, you're being paid. This isn't for you. We need to get something that they enjoy because it's most likely that, I know that when I'm older, if they're playing hip hop for me, I'll probably like lean over and punch them. <laughs> um, so sometimes things that are, are cuddly can be reassuring. I know there's the robotic seal, you know, even sometimes stuffed animals. Actually, animals themselves are hugely comforting, and there, there's a number of facilities where they have, and here again, I would say, I would definitely take older animals. I would say, no puppies, no kitties. I'll, as cute as they are, I, I think they would make me more agitated as well. And when things really, you know, get tough, sometimes even white noise in studies has been shown to be helpful, but, you know, I think we could do better than that. Dance and art. I've got to say, helping folks still be creative is huge. So, so the engagement of singing, I like person-to-person uh, person much better than having you know, the, the video of the woman playing church hymns. Having someone there that can engage, that can connect in whatever way they can connect. Having art to be able to paint, or if, if someone can't draw, draft the way they used to, they can still express themselves. I had one woman who was really quite irritable 
and she was just very angry about a number of things, but it turned out she did ballet and so did I. So we just started moving. I mean, and, and that really brought her out of, of her funk. So I would suggest engagement in whatever level seems to work for your elder. And it's, it's a, often a um, trial and error. You know, someone who used to do a lot in the kitchen, well, maybe they can't make the recipes as they did, but you can get the easy bake cookies and pet them and then cook them, and it's really enjoyable. Um, the balloon volleyball is always great as well. Uh, so they have done studies and they found that professional caregivers who are trained to effectively use um, these techniques, which is appropriate eye contact, and I apologize, um, I made a mistake and the slides for behaviors come after the slides for medications, but it just makes sense for me to take, talk about behaviors first, so look a little farther in your slides and you'll find uh, these slides. Um, so it's really appropriate to uh, use appropriate eye contact. So often if you're standing over someone with dementia, you might be threatening to them. You want to get down on their level and, and have an open face. You want to be you want to be pleasant looking and you want to be calm. You know, they may not be able to find the words, but they sure are going to pick up on the emotions. So if you're saying, oh, look what you did. You know, you, you, why did you do that? You're going to get them upset and they're probably going to fight you back. They're not going to quite understand what's going on as opposed to saying, oh, look, you know, there's some, there's some water on your shirt. Let's go, and would you like the red one or the blue one? And then you wait. You know, you, you announce one thing at a time. Um, you don't say, okay, get on your shirt, put on your shoes, we're late for breakfast. You'd say, okay, would you like the red shirt or the blue shirt? And you'll know how long it takes them to process because they may be quiet for a while, but then they'll say, the red one. And that's how long it's going to take. And if you know that they don't like to get up before 8 or 9 o'clock, you're probably not going to have a 9 o'clock doctor's appointment. So you, what you're going to do is try and work with their biorhythms um, for success. So the other thing that's really important is distraction and, and um, diversion. So if someone has gotten up, it's like, no, I am not going to brush my teeth. If you say, no, you really have to brush your teeth now, you know, and you try and hold their hand and make them do it, is that gonna, is that gonna work? No, not at all. Um, so I would say that in that situation, you go away, and I have a good friend, Stephanie Howard, who does a lot of teaching in this area and works with elders, and she does change of face. Sometimes you can put on a different sweater, sometimes you can put on a different hat, and you can be the different person coming in. If you have a bigger community, you can have a different person come in, you know, give them five minutes to cool down, come in, do something else, and then try a different approach. Um, I would say one of the things I learned from, um, oh, I'm blanking on her name. I'm having a senior moment. Um, who is our favorite lady? Tifa Snow, thank you so much. Um, can I have you come over here? Yeah, you can. So, one of, so as dementia progresses, some of the things that are more difficult once you come up here is feeding and brushing teeth. You know, they're like, I'm fine, you know, you don't need to help me at all. Or as things, as an elder gets more progressed in their disease, they, you know, and they're not feeding themselves, we want to help them. But it can be really, and a good um, experiment for you all to do for each other is to try and feed your, your care partner. You know, it's really kind of, it's disconcerting having someone shove something in your mouth and, you know, what's going on here. So what Tifa Snow said was um, to do hand over hand. So it's like you're shaking their hand, you hook the thumb, and then you can take, you, um, so you hook thumb over thumb, and then you take, and I promise I'm not going to get too close. You can take either the spoon or the toothbrush, and you can feed them or brush their teeth, and they have their arm, thank you so much. They have their arm to let them know that something's coming in. You know, that's kind of what they're used to. So you kind of slow down and you go with what's working. Oh, and do not argue with the patient. <laughs> Folks with dementia are not trying to be difficult. You know, even, <laughs> I, I also find, I know that when I get my dementia, I'm going to probably be hell on wheels because I have to find doctors, lawyers, and engineers, and, and you know, owners of business, businesses. Don't go quietly into the, into the good night. Um, <laughs> You might have someone who's been kind of irritable or difficult through their life, but when they have dementia, they don't have control. I had one son say to me, 
Um, well, it was good when mom forgot who we were because she was always nicer to the company than she was to us. <laughs> you need to remember they're not doing it on purpose. Arguing and trying to reason ain't gonna get you there. It's kind of like having a 16 year old again. I can't wait to get past that point. Um, let's see, so the behavior management, when the group of uh, nursing assistants who had the training and motivation, so that's important for anyone who works with facilities or groups, given the motivation to use these techniques that I mentioned before, they had a, a decreased patient agitation at six months. So that's with no medication, so that's our goal. So we want to try and have good eye contact, discuss one uh, item at a time, give them time to process, not argue, and divert them if they're getting upset. I, I had um, a great example of that was I was seeing a woman and they were playing some music and uh, they were doing a um, word puzzle in the next room. And then a fight broke out between two of the gentlemen in the group. And all of a sudden they whipped up a song like, Happy days are here again. And everyone started singing and like that was the end of the fight. That's what we want to do. Uh, so here's just a study that showed that if you let uh, people, if you don't bother people at night and you keep them active during the day, they won't be so agitated. Hey. Um, so common medications, uh, Dr. Edgerly went over most of these. I think I'm going to talk a little bit about the side effects. Um, I would agree that we don't have anything else, so it's probably not a bad idea, and yes, you have to go back to the, the beginning, I'm sorry. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have fabulous treatments, but sometimes these can be helpful, and I actually have found that sometimes it can be helpful for behavior. Um, but the things that we need to look out for, for Aricept, is sometimes it can make you not want to eat. Sometimes it can give you a low heart rate, and these are all on my website at elderconsult.com under medications. Um, it can make your blood pressure go lower. It can give you diarrhea. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting side effects from these medications, and when I worked as a hospice medical director, I'd often see people with advanced dementia on Aricep, and I will tell you, you will die faster from not eating than not taking your Aricept. So that is one concern. Um, the Exelon has a patch, so sometimes it doesn't have as much stomach problems, but it can give you balance problems. Nemenda um, sometimes can be helpful, and I, I will mention anecdotally. So the studies aren't great. Um, I work with a lot of folks with behavior issues, and you know my favorite medications are ice cream, Tylenol, gabapentin, which helps with muscle skeletal pain and nerve pain, and then citalopram. And we'll talk about that. That's one of the more gentle antidepressants. Um, so I, we try not to use medications. One gentleman where the Aricept and Amenda really made a difference was he was paranoid. He thought people were going to kill him and he was going to kill them. And it was really scary for his wife who he was living with. And so we had to give him some stronger behavioral medications which didn't sedate him but helped keep him from you know, being so fearful that someone was going to kill him. And then his dementia progressed and I got rid of the other um, stronger medications. And then I stopped the Aricept and the Nemenda, and then all of a sudden his paranoia came back. You know, he was very scared again. And so in that case, I gave it to him at a little lower dose. Um, but in that situation, it made a difference in his behavior. It, there are some folks who are scared, no, if I take him off Aricept, they may not get back to where they were. That's, don't worry about that. As Dr. Edgerly said, um, it's a modest improvement. For some people, it makes more difference than others. If you're not thinking you're seeing anything after three months, six months, you might stop just that medication and watch. If it doesn't make any difference, then that wasn't helpful. Um, if, like this gentleman, he had these symptoms, these behaviors coming back, then it might be a sign that for this person it's helpful. The Nemenda, you gotta watch out because it makes people sedated. And I've seen people who are sedated, who are aspirating, who just can't even wake up to eat. And because the, the men does not recognize as being sedating, are left on that medication. So I'm gonna try and point out that the huge principle in addressing behaviors, if you need to address them for safety or for quality of life, that's the only two times I will use um, 
medications, and I use it at the smallest dose possible for the shortest time possible. If someone is doing well and they're on psychoactive medications, whether it's a sleeping pill, whether it's Ativan, whether it's Xanax, whether it's an antipsychotic, those need to be tapered down. End of story, because those medications will make them decline faster, they will cause problems. So, Nomenda is something that we use and can be useful in some folks, but if someone is sedated, you definitely want to take that off. So the neuroleptics, as Dr. Edgerly said, is that Haldol is the most um, likely to cause what the, what's known as extrapyramidal symptoms. That's stiffness, and um, I trained back when they were using some of the older antipsychotics, you know, Thorazine, Stelazine, and if you see anyone on those medications, they should come off. There's just a few that I've run into, but they should come off. And I would go as far to say as no one should be maintained on Haldol. Um, it causes too much uh, stiffness. It, it can make people just dopey. It robs them of their existence. Now, there are some diseases, uh, such as Huntington's disease, that um, it is the treatment because the whole premise of Huntington's disease is they have way too much dopamine. Uh, the Risperdal mm -hmm. is very helpful in decreasing delusions and paranoia, um, but that also can make people stiff, that these medications all can make uh, folks more likely to fall. They will make them decline faster, um, and they should only be thought about after you've tried to fix everything else. So this is after you've gotten rid of all the medications that cause problems, this is after you've engaged folks and they're uh, doing things they enjoy, and you've treated their pain to the point that they are not looking like they're in pain. Um, actually, I, I don't have a slide on it, so I'm gonna take a, a side detour for pain here for a minute. Um, one of the things I like to say is, uh, dementia does not cure arthritis. So if someone was taking Tylenol or Vicodin or um, Naproxen for their arthritis, and then they get dementia, their, their pain likely did not go away. And so one of the, there's a study that showed that folks who took Tylenol every day, um, and there's now a long-acting Tylenol, so you can take just 650 uh, two or three times a day, and that will get rid of a lot of agitation. So that's, as I said, ice cream Tylenol. There's a Tylenol aspect. You have to be careful because the other thing Tylenol does is take away the likelihood that you're going to develop, develop a fever. So someone could start having a bladder infection, someone could start having a pneumonia, and they may have pneumonia and not cough, which is scary. But if they, they change their behavior, they get more lethargic, they stop eating, they get more agitated, you gotta always look for the, the urine um, infection and the pneumonia. So if we treated uh, their pain, we've got them engaged, and they're still quite delusional and paranoid to the point that it's not safe to care for them, or they're just miserable. They think that their wife is going to kill them, is going to poison them. Then I would say, well, we can talk about using a little bit of the antipsychotics. This is a very controversial area, and it's very abused. Most of the time when these medications are used, it's for sleep, it's for you know an elder being annoying, and they can be used to control folks, um, to control elders to the point where they're sedated. And there's, there's regulations against that in uh, nursing homes, but we need to be aware of that at home. We need to be aware of it um, in facilities as well. No one should be sedated during the day. They might get sleepy, they might need an hour rest because that's gonna help them um, be less cranky for the afternoon. It will allow them to enjoy their activities more, but no one should be sedated. If they're sedated and they're on any medications that can make them more sleepy, those medications must be stopped. Uh, so, let's see, Zyprexa is another antipsychotic that sometimes can make the blood sugar go up. And then Seroquel is one that we see a lot. Often I'll see uh, Ativan or Lorazepam and Seroquel used. Not a good combination. Seroquel um, can help with sleep in someone who's delusional, but I see it just used the same way I see Xanax or Ativan used, just to quiet someone down. We shouldn't use it just to quiet people down. Um, all of these can make people more restless. 
It's uh, something called uh, akathisia, and Haldol and Risperdal are the worst, but you can still get it from Seroquel or the Zyprexa. So you can get too sleepy with it, you can, you're um, walking in your balance probably will decline, so you want to minimize use of these medications. Uh, the Zyprexa can make your uh, blood sugar worse. Uh, the other uh, area that I see really abused is called anxiolytics or anti-anxiety medications, the benzodiazepines. Um, I should have Xanax up there. Xanax is like one of the number one selling drugs in America. <laughs> I see it given like chiclets, not only to folks with dementia, but to the spouse, to, to, the, to the children. You know, it's like if you feel anxious, here's a script. Well, I like to say that Xanax or Alprazolam is the crack of benzos. It's twice as strong as the lorazepam or the Ativan, and it's short acting. So just like crack, you know, I, I trained in New York City, I know about these things, there's probably not that much about here. But crack is a more concentrated form of cocaine, and just the way crack had a quicker onset and, and withdrawal period, the same thing for Xanax. So you can start withdrawing within three or four hours, and someone, I see Xanax sometimes given just once a day, and so you're definitely gonna be more anxious by a different part of that day, and so it is used as indication that you need more of the same drug. What you really need to do is get rid of that drug, and that can be difficult. You have to taper it very slowly. Um, I also see uh, lorazepam or Ativan used a lot. They use it as needed. And the most common cascade I see, and I like to say that even things like Ambien are a gateway drug. Don't use Ambien, um, particularly not for someone with dementia. It is something that um, can make you more dependent on the medication, and then you can withdraw from the Ambien as well. Um, that's Zolpidem for the generic. And so someone can be taking that and they might sleep a little better, but maybe for just four hours at night, so they ask for more, so you go from five milligrams up to 10 milligrams, and then you start withdrawing in the afternoon, so you get a little more agitated, so you get an Ativan as needed, and then you take that as needed, but then you're withdrawing from that as well, so then they start giving Ativan three times a day, and I just see it snowball. You know, don't go there. So I would say that um, what I like to use for sleep, um, for sleep. I like to use first activity. This is where it gets really messy. Um, I would say that the antidepressants such as citalopram, which is sedating, and remeron, which is sedating, um, can be helpful. You gotta talk to the doctor. Um, something like the gabapentin could be helpful for some people. The nice thing about the gabapentin is that it helps with muscle, uh, skeletal pain, and nerve pain, and that might help them sleep, but it might be too much. So I'm not gonna tell you as much specifically what to use, I'm gonna tell you more what to look out for. Um, the other thing, that I do house calls, and when I, you know, they, they give me the list of medications from the doctor, but then I go into their medicine cabinet, and what do I find? Tylenol PM and Unisom. They're not safe just because they're over the counter. Not a good idea. So, so what's wrong with Tylenol PM? It's got the Benadryl in it. And you know, when I went through training, we used Benadryl to help alcoholics go to sleep. And now I'm thinking, well, that wasn't such a good idea. But it is not safe for elders. It's very anticholinergic. As Dr. Edgerly was saying, um, when the, the uh, brain cells are dying, the neurons are dying, then they don't make as much choline, and the Aricept and such are anticholinesterase inhibitors, so it increases the choline. If you take um, Benadryl, if you take bladder pills, Detrol, Ditropan, Sanctura, any of those bladder pills, those are all anticholinergic, and they will decrease your uh, choline and your brain function. So if you're taking Aricept and Detrol, or Aricept and Tylenol PM, you're fighting against yourself, and getting rid of those medications is gonna make your elder feel much better. <laughs> Sleeping pills are not better. Um, the Halcyon or um, Restoril, Tamazepam, I don't use those. They are all, you're gonna have a withdrawal syndrome, and for any of those, do not stop them cold. 
Um, the other one I don't have up here is clonazepam, and I'm realizing that a lot of doctors are saying, well, you know, if we don't want the short-acting withdrawal, we'll use a, a nice, smooth, longer one. Uh, clonazepam is something that is uh, three times more powerful than Ativan. So these have all been shown to lead to falls and contribute to decreased cognition, and it can make the behavior worse, so why are we using them? The problem is that for the first few months, the people look better, they're calmer, they don't respond. But then it, it, they're addictive the way alcohol is addictive. So just like an alcoholic, it you know gets more irritable and they need more and more alcohol. That's the same way with these medications, the anti-anxiety pills. Would you give your loved one a shot of vodka every time they were irritable? <laughs> Think about it, you know giving them shots of vodka. Um, the antidepressants. So these are complicated. As I said, I like the Telegram or the Selexin, that's the last one. It's more gentle, but again, it can give you diarrhea, it can make your salts go down, it can give you stomach upset and make you not eat. So if, if you are on any medications and you're having symptoms, it might be a symptom of the medication, and so you want to be taking off that medication and looking at it before you add on a pill to help with the diarrhea, you know, Lamotil, Lamotium, which are anticholinergic, which will make you more agitated. Um, all of those can give you loose stools. Uh, the Zoloft is energizing, which is good for someone who is kind of more sleepy all the time or apathetic. I would say never use Paxil. It's too anticholinergic, which means it can make them more confused. Never use Prozac. Prozac is like having a double espresso every day. And I've seen a number of patients who, or elders, who are on Prozac or Zoloft and then they're also on a sleeping pill because the Prozac and Zoloft makes it so they don't sleep. So should you give them Zoloft and then give them Ambien? No. No, or should we take them both away and keep them active during the day and get rid of the caffeine and alcohol? Oh, you know what I didn't talk to you about uh, getting rid of alcohol? I mean, it's easy to say. It's hard to do, you know, because people like their rituals. And one of the things that's important to me is to keep um, folks uh, in their rituals. So like having a cocktail in the evening, I would um, use O'Doul's beer, I would use non-alcoholic wine, and sometimes that doesn't work, so you try and just make smaller and smaller glasses. Um, and sometimes you get to the point where you can say, oh, it's just a different, you know, it's a different year, it's a different vintage. And sometimes that works. Um, and with hard alcohol, I would cut it, um, by a third, and then I'd cut it by a half, and then I'd cut it by three-fourths, and I'd use small glasses. You know, so that's how you get there until they get to the point where they don't remember it, and, and then I'd get rid of it. Um, so nausea, vomiting, weight loss, and sometimes low sodium is a problem. Oh, I see a lot of Effexor or um, Venlafaxine or Cymbalta, uh, duloxetine use. Those are really complicated. Those are very energizing and can also make behavior worse. So if someone didn't get better on Zoloft or Celexa, I don't know that I would go to Effexor. And I, I am very much, appreciative, uh, very much appreciative of the fact that um, there aren't enough good geriatric psychiatrists. So we want to make sure that we um, just are careful. If we're seeing problems with these medications, we let our doctors know. So um, for delusions, psychosis, and paranoia, if we've tried everything else, we might think of the antipsychotics. Um, I'm gonna just skip mood liability, and with depression and the antidepressants, you don't have to be withdrawn and sad. You might be just irritable and angry, and they can still help with the nerve endings. Um, and the categories often overlap. Um, so here's a woman who, just for an example, 80-year-old woman was seen by her doctor and felt to have Alzheimer's with agitation. She has a shuffling gait, and she's cogwheeling, which are symptoms of Parkinson's. She was put on a lansipine or zyprexa, and her agitation decreased, but she was more steady on her feet, and she stayed in bed most, uh, most of the time. Six months later, her daughter sought a second opinion, and this was all from the olanzapine or zyprexa. It made her stiffer, it made her lose her balance, and she lost her ability to walk from that medication. Not okay, we want to taper them more quickly. I realized that it's, um, I've gone on a little bit more on the side details that I wanted to share, so I'm not gonna do the other case studies right now. I would like to uh, have time for questions. So does anyone have any questions? I know that was a damn dumb one. Yes. Right, 
So the sleep deprivation er, uh, does melatonin help? For some people it can be helpful, for other people it can be agitating. So in that sort of situation, I'd be using Tylenol three times a day, I'd keep them busy during the day. I would, you can try three milligrams of melatonin. And the one thing I'd say about the nutraceuticals is there's a lot of stuff in them, like the, the weight loss stuff, you know what's in there? Sudafed, you know, so it can make people buzzy and you don't know what it is. I, I am very much a naturalist. I'm into fruits and vegetables and then not using herbal supplements for uh, dementia because every preparation, even if it says it has melatonin, it might have some other stuff like a little Benadryl in it, which can be more confusing. Um, so I, I'm careful with it. Some people it helps and other people it makes it worse. So it's kind of trial and error. Anyone else? Yes. Um, you didn't mention about the side effects of residue. The, the side effects of Razadine. So there again, it is um, the GI upset and the decreased appetite. And so it, that, those are one of the things. On my um, website on the medications, it has a more complete list. This is kind of a, a short list. Yes? Oh, what's the difference between the Exelon patch and the Menda? Okay, so the Aricept um, and the Exelon are anticholinesterase inhibitors. The Menda works on a different receptor, so they're complementary. Um, the Exelon or the Aricept, some people tolerate the Exelon patch if they don't uh, tolerate the Aricept, um, but the Menda just works on a different pathway. You can take an Amenda and Exelon together the way you could take Aricept and Amenda, correct? If you're not having side effects. Yes? So, other times people are learning ages and different diagnoses, and there's a lot of people who have major medical illnesses that are on the look at these medications that are going to cause all these problems, and they're going to be more at risk, or they have Right, so uh, people who have mental illness, um, I will say that I would be very careful with the benzos and people with major mental illness as well, particularly as they age. Um, I just find that long-term, they cause more problems in many diseases, bipolar, schizophrenia. Um, the, more you, the more you can tune into what's the side effects and communicate that back to the doctor and say, I think this medication might be it, you know, the, the more, and, and I realize I've, I've been a hospice medical director up in Sonoma County, so I know that there's not as many psychiatrists, there's not as many resources. And oh, which brings me to, I'm trying to develop an online community either on Facebook for Elder Consult or on my website to talk about these issues. You know, and I'm not gonna tell you exactly what to do for each person, but I, uh, for that specific person, you need to talk to the doctor, but I'm happy to talk about the principles and what to do in those cases. Um, like. There's a number of ways that we can address pain, and if someone is getting quite stiff and they're on Risperdal, well, it might be the Risperdal causing the stiffness. Yes, in the back. How do you uh, treat cold symptoms in a patient? How do I treat cold symptoms in a patient? No Sudafed. No Sudafed. I like Mucinex um, because that makes thick mucus thinner. Um, Robitussin DM is not bad. I do lots of warm fluids and some Tylenol, and um, I don't give cough drops to someone I think they're going to choke. If, I, if someone has a really bad cough, sometimes I'll give them a little codeine, but I'm careful with that. So elders with um, dementia are not going to be aware when they're getting constipation. You need to do that. Anytime you give anything that can be constipating, which includes gabapentin, codeine, uh, Vicodin, um, calcium, you need to make sure that they're getting something to help their bowels. Yes? That's a very good one. What to do about allergies? So we know Benadryl is not good. Um, Claritin, loratadine is better. It's, it, it does not cross the brain barrier, but it's not as effective as something called Zyrtec or Sertazine. Zyrtec can make people look more agitated and confused. It is anticholinergic and I would try not to use it. Um, you can also use nasal saline to flush them out. You can try and, <laughs> and my kids are allergic to cats. I know some families who just treat everyone with antihistamines, you know, and keep the cat, but you can get rid of the things if you can to cut down the allergies. Well, thank you all, oh, yes. 
Oh, the website is, oops. Uh, elderconsult.com and we're on Facebook. I'm trying to, so my, my biggest problem is I'm not really, um, I don't do a lot on the internet, but I am trying to develop a, a place to talk about these things and also get it out beyond the few hundred families that I work with um, to, to talk about, you know, what do you do about uh, having a cold? What do you do about constipation? Um, what do you do if, you know, your loved one is screaming at you in the middle of the night every night, you know, and you've got to get to work the next day? You know, I, I'm not going to give specific indications on what medications to use, but uh, it is a place to talk about these things and get resources. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll be looking for your questions.